welcome to Some Arts. I'm Dave, and with me in the studio is James Webb. Mm -hmm. How are you doing, James? Doing great, doing great. How are you doing today? I'm doing all right. Great, good. And James is the artist in residency at, artist in residence, mm -hmm. not artist in residency, <laughs> at the Mudflat Pottery Studios. Um, how you do? How, how is that going? It, Mudflat is, is great. Uh, I would like to start by saying that Mudflat is a very, it's a very, uh, there's a loyal kind of community there, a very supportive community at the Mud Flat. Um, I, when I first started in Kentucky, mm -hmm. uh, I, well, I was in Kentucky and then uh, for a short time before I was in different places, but I'd come back to Kentucky where I'm from. Yeah. And then when I got accepted to Mud Flat, I had s some different offers, but then I chose Mud Flat. And it being in Boston really wasn't that much of a culture shock because I was already coming to a place that accepted me and wanted me there. Uh, so it was really, I really kind of fit in and it was a very smooth and nice transition to come up here and then be part of you know people are already excited about me coming up uh, before I was even here to you know because they wanted to see what you know my work was like and yeah. uh, after I was approved so uh, it was it was really smooth transition coming up here it was very accepting I've, I've seen images of your work and uh, I can see why they were excited it's, it's exciting <laughs> thank work. you thank yeah, you we'll talk about that soon this past weekend mm -hmm. the mudflat had a pottery sale yes which is the largest uh, sale event that they hold each year yes yes um, how did that go for you uh, it went great. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes uh, pots move a little better than others. Sometimes the years, it kind of fluctuates. You're not sure how it's going to go. Uh, but it's been good. And the opening was November 30th. That was Friday. And it was really exciting to see so much support there and so many people within the mudflat community directly or so many some you know the people that come back every year uh, that come back to the sales and you know like to support the artists and like to buy the pots and a lot of conversation and excitement around ceramics and this kind of common uh, you know kind of uh, cohesion that's around ceramics that kind of bring people together that I think is pretty lovely so it's great it's, great. it's really good how, how long has the residency been going on at mudflat uh, so the residency uh, the mudflat itself has been around since 1971 mm -hmm. and so it's you know it's been around a long time. It has a reputation within the ceramic community specifically. It has a good one. Uh, you know I heard about it even before I got there from from other people. And there's a lot of people that come out of there doing good things. And um, so uh, the residency itself, yeah, it's, it's wonderful. Do you have any upcoming workshops that you're going to be teaching? Uh, Are they open to the public, or is it mostly for Mudflat members? We do have, uh, you, anybody can take workshops. Yeah. Uh, there are members, you can sign up for as a member. Uh, I specifically, I teach two classes a semester. It's beginning, wheel, beginning to advanced wheel throwing, and I teach uh, two classes a week. And there's going to be, uh, well, uh, next week is our last class. Uh, so, I mean, the semester's about really fast. It's very humbling to be, a, to be an instructor there because some of these, people that I'm instructing have been in clay on and off or consistency or consistent to some degree f over the course of uh, you know a longer t period of time than I've been born uh, so so I'm learning I think that's part of the reason I love being a teacher is you l learn from your students yeah so um, there's you know it's it's really the dynamic and, and, and age and experience is, is is always keeping me interested how did you get involved in uh, ceramics yourself well uh, so, you know, my undergrad professor um, in ceramics was very charismatic. And I think he, I, although, you know, I've always been really kinesthetic growing up, so I've always loved to work with my hands. And um, I grew up doing uh, some different, uh, different types of labor that I loved to use my hands. And I, uh, I took a non-major class one time. My, my, I was undeclared where I was skipping around from major to major. And, uh, I remember my uh, uh, advisor, I remember his name, he goes, you know what, you need to fill section 19 and take an art class. You need to just get this done and over Oh, with. so you weren't even an art major. Uh, what, no, not at all. <laughs> now, to be fair, I'd drawn my whole life growing up. And yeah. I'd drawn ducks and had, you know, had some on stamps for like Ducks Unlimited and, that, and this and that a little bit. But I was specifically just two, you know, two dimensional artist, really just drawing. But then uh, I went to college, I took this uh, ceramics class for non-majors. My instructor was incredibly charismatic, uh, and and he he really knew how to convey um, excitement to students uh, when he taught ceramics. He got me interested. You know, two weeks later, I was like, I want to be a ceramics major. I love I love the feel of clay. I love to touch it. So from there, the rest is history, really. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Um, and it it's it's a, it sounds a little like not not the art school tract that you normally hear from people like, oh, you know, I, I knew that I wanted to go to art school. I right. knew I wanted to do this. Right. Um, 
that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, I've always loved art, yeah. um, and I, but I never underst I never knew how much capacity I had to appreciate it until I really started getting into ceramics. Mm -hmm. And then I really started kind of branching off and started uh, you know, reaching, researching more about it and you know, taking classes on art history, and that was just fascinating to me. That's, that's awesome. Let's take a look at some of your work. Sure. The thing that, that strikes me the most is the way that you play with um, color mm -hmm. and texture, and you're referencing very familiar like foods right. and fabric. But I don't want to say too much. Like I sure. kind of want, <laughs> sure. want to hear from you about them uh, because they're, they're fascinating objects. They really are. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, so uh, I'll keep this kind of in a nutshell. But basically, my I think every artist has to have a creative strategy and in a way that they have a starting off point to, to make their art. Mm -hmm. So there has to be some kind of philosophy or concept there uh, to start off with that encourages you to go to more and keep on making work and developing it. For me, um, I, my work initially is based off of lexical gustatory synesthesia, which you've heard of people having synesthesia about. They can see color, they can see, they see numbers and colors in their mind's eye, or they perceive them as such. Or, or there's an overlapping of senses where somebody can listen to something and taste something. Yeah. So, uh, but less of gustatory synesthesia, you know, I can perceive words phonetically uh, as taste. And so what I do is I make, like over, I, I talk about issues that are hard to pin down and are, are hard to uh, really define objectively in art. Uh, and, and I make them into objects. Uh, so I talk about this idea of art itself. Because, uh, you know, after, you know, because we're in this postmodernist era, uh, you know, it's really hard to, to define what art is because I think there's a lot of historical reasons leading up to this point that have to do with that. Uh, so I, I'm literally saying art. I'm taking the word art, and I'm, I'm coming from the best way that I know how to define it for myself, or the word beauty. Um, and so beauty to me is is a thick, viscous, tastes like a thick, viscous coconut milk uh, that is pouring into a vat of more coconut milk that has a hint of lavender in it. Or like the word art is a really juicy cheeseburger. Wow, uh, with, I like that. You know, with, I've, with, I've never heard those definitions. Right, and so yeah. and so that's and that's how I perceive those things. And so I make art based on issues, and I underline that art with uh, with some um, uh, some concepts about Roman sculptures uh, to talk about the idea of materiality consensus and authenticity yeah you talked about postmodernism and art and sure. um, one of those things that was floating around was, uh, was like art is whatever you you think it is right which is valid but a little problematic for me well if I asked you if I, if I said Dave yeah I, I want make one in any media that you want, any medium that you want to, or a mold, or you know, a, a combination of thereof, whatever. If I were to ask you to make one piece of art that embodied what the word beauty meant to you, mm -hmm. that would be very difficult for you to do, or anybody. Yeah. For me, my creative strategy, I use synesthesia as my creative strategy, so I have a very innate sense of what words mean to me based on what they taste like or how I perceive them phonetically mm -hmm. when someone says them or I hear them in my mind's eye. And so it's easy for me to go, this is what it is. Mm -hmm. So I take that scenario and that, uh, that kind of landscape or that, that picture I'm painting in my head and I formally I bring it out into real life and then make formal decisions about it and then add layers of historical information. Um, to explain it, I also, there's a, a, um, a Swiss linguist, he was, his name was Ferdinand de Saussure, and he uses the idea of, he uses his, the form, I use the formulation of his lexical semantics uh, to explain um, uh, what I'm trying to say with my work. So I'll use his idea of the sign, his development of the sign, looking at language uh, in a very particular way. Mm -hmm. And I use that and with diagrams in, in such a way to explain how I connect words with taste, with what they mean to me, and how I connect it with my artwork, basically. It, it's funny you should mention layering and diagrams, because uh, um, going through some of your work here, I, I recall uh, medical illustration, like the, the cross section. Right, uh, right, the yes, cross cut, absolutely. Where you see, uh, you know, you know what I'm talking about, like where, where you see layers of uh, muscle and tissue and, and veins. And um, some of your textures recall for me uh, ground beef. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and, Good. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, like, like this one in particular. Yeah, the, so you have this, this uh, like overriding tension in your work because there's, there's these, these two 
contrasts in, right. in textures and colors and and uh, very very unexpected. And, and like how the hamburger, it can even it can be kind of it can feel visceral because it can look like uh, muscle fibers or anything else connected with something organic, and then the other can look like marble or 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 um, it can look like. Uh, veins or fabric. And so I think that when you have something really static and sharp and pristine against something that's very organic, I think there's this point, the edge where those two things come together, uh, there's a point where it's, poten it's like a potential energy. It's like a, something that's static feels very potential to me, the way potential energy converts to kinetic energy. Yeah. So something that's very static that hits something very dynamic in movement to the eye, that point at which they meet, that is the most interesting point to me because that's where the two things come together and that's right between potential and kinetic energy somewhere. So on a technical level, yeah. um, is this is this a combining of different techniques? Are these all the same kinds of clay, or, or uh, is, is like I imagine that that's a porcelain veneer there, but I, I'm not sure. Right, right. <laughs> so uh, all what's my, going on? My, the, my sculpture is uh, low fire, uh -huh. which means uh, porcelain. You know, to get real, to really get the brilliancy out of porcelain, it needs to be fired high to a higher temperature than I fire my work. But uh, it's all the same clay. Uh, body, uh, but I do sometimes use different. I use different glazes or different colorants, or even different materials to surface my work. It really reminds me when I think of art. When I taste that, when you put those lexical units together, and in, in my vessel in my mouth, what really happens is um, art. You know, when you get melted cheese on, let's say, on a burger, and it's in a skillet or on a grill. Yeah. When that cheese starts to solidify and it starts to get a surface tension over it, but it gets a surface tension, so it kind of loses the, that kind of glossiness and becomes more op seemingly more um, uh, matte or, or sheeny. Mm -hmm. It gets that surface tension over it, but you know it's like melting underneath. So it's kind of that potential of kinetic energy. The cheese that's solid or that's melted that is going solid or is solid and is going to melting. There's this idea of being potential and kinetic energy there, something that starts off as static, like a solid piece of cheese, and because of influence like heat, it becomes kinetic because of the way that it starts to move. And so that I'm really trying to induce that kind of idea visually in my work. So, so the, when you're when you're trying to depict these these moments that are kind of frozen in mm -hmm. time because they have to be because you're trying to finish a piece and you're right. depicting like a, a particular moment. Because, you know, I always hear that um, you know people tell me you know pots reflect you know or you can look at pots you can look at someone's work yeah it's a reflection of who they are you know we talk about you know, artists so it should be right you're trying to you're trying to get some kind of essence out something and. Uh, people look at my work and they go, you know, that's really weird. I mean, you're kind of weird, <laughs> but it's a good weird. I like it's, weird. It's, yeah, I like weird too. And so a lot of that's supposed to reference um, Roman sculptures. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm careful not to say Roman sculpture uh, because um, a lot of Roman sculptures in particular were just, uh, some of them were copies of Greek sculptures. Right. Uh, because a lot of the Greek sculptures were made in bronze and they could be retrieved and then they were, of course I understand that there's a lot of labor and there's, there's the artist's hand in the sense they were very technically very good, but a lot of these are just copies of, of, of Greek sculptures because the deities are, like, are, are the same with, with you know, those. Uh, and, and so um, there's this very sore question in my mind of authenticity. Because what makes these authentic, in the Roman, some Roman sculptures that are marble, is not the fact that they were created uh, with a concept or an idea by somebody that was trying to imagine a deity and they had a dream and they were going to make this amazing sculpture out of it. They, in some cases, uh, it's just because it was made out of marble. So by cultural consensus, it was authentic based on the materiality that was made out of, not based on the idea behind it in some, in some ways. And so I'm really interested in that. And so that's why a lot of the work I do, I make it a little Trump Lloyd. I make the cheese look like cheese. I make the hamburger look like hamburger. It is what it's not. But there's something authentic about it. Um, there's something that can be profound about looking at something that looks like something else, yeah. uh, even if it's in a stylistic way. And so I want to bring up this issue of, of materiality in my work and authenticity. Have you um, seen some of the, the latest research where they uh, were able to depict how those statues were painted? Um, there was a, a great New, York, right. New Yorker article that came out uh, a couple months ago that um, some researcher is, is trying to recreate the, how, how these uh, statues were originally painted. And right. they're very vibrant, it turns out. 
Oh, important. absolutely, absolutely. And we a lot of them we know is just the bare marble. Yeah. But they're not. Yeah. Uh, very vibrantly painted. Of course, over time, it was very quickly those uh, dissipated or completely just faded away. Yeah, but yeah, that's very that's very interesting. You know, I think that speaks. Uh, you know, because at this time, you know, when art was made, there was there was a hierarchy, of there was this hierarchy where um, you had to have so many uh, rules about making things to, for it to be art, like a, almost like a checklist, right? All the way up until modernism. Uh, to very you know contemporary art, American art or uh, contemporary art in general. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, without a hierarchy now of which to, um, I think that's why it's so hard to understand what what art is sometimes, is because it, it can be so subjective. We're in this age of what I call subjective truism. It's something I made up. I don't know if it's a thing or not. And it fits really well with your with your own. <laughs> right, exactly. It sure does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and is there going to be an exhibition of your work anytime soon? Yes, in the area? Uh, yeah, uh, there will be. I will have an exhibition at. The, it's part of my residency at the Mud Flat. That's another part of it. Not only do you get to curate shows as a resident artist and come up with themes and the, the ideas for these shows, uh, you get to have a show at the end. And there's a sh they have a showroom, and uh, you um, basically at the end of your residency, you you make a body of work, and then things that you've been working on while you're there and then you show that body of work and it's on display for I don't know how long it's on display but um, probably it's I would assume probably a month or so because it'll probably be uh, in July sometime I, I believe don't hold me to that all right we'll look uh, out for that in the late summer oh good yeah good, <laughs> yeah well uh, thank you JW for uh, coming into the studio with me. Absolutely, I've enjoyed um, it. Yeah, I really enjoyed talking to you about your work, which uh, I encourage people to uh, seek JW's work out. Where can they find you on uh, the World so, Wide Web? Right, so I kind of drag my knuckles a little bit when it comes to technology. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> a web a website it's like a website is something that um, I keep talking about, and I have. You know, so I'm kind of in the pre-stages okay. of getting that together. Okay. Uh, so I don't officially have a website. Uh, you can find me on Facebook or Instagram, um, and you can find me on, uh, if you Google James Webb Ceramics, you can find me, and the first one that comes up, um, you can, because uh, I was a new, I was a new Harmony Clay project before this, a different residency, and so through them you can find me. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. All right.